Hello everyone, this is Joel back at it again with Back Fast with Russ and uh, today's edition is going to be none other than the European royalties Real Madrid and I'm with Del and Antonio here. Del, how are you doing today? Very good. It's been a good week of football, good month of football and I'm sure you guys are looking forward to it. Antonio, welcome back once again. It's nice to always connect back with you, you know, the brains of football, like I've always mentioned. <laughs> and I hope you're Thank doing you. good. I'm doing well. Thank you very much. And, and once again, it's an absolute pleasure to, to be here in the show. Yeah, you know, uh, whenever we hear about Real Madrid, you no, know, it's all about the, uh, the fancy football, the fancy signings and none of them, the trophy hulls. But uh, today, we're going to dive a little bit deep, you know, we, we're going to let our viewers know uh, you know what Real Madrid is really all about. You know, are they really just about the signings, you know, the trophy winnings? Because I believe there are more than just trophies. You know, uh, the philosophies, uh, the ideas that you know, the brains of Madrid. It's something uh, not easy to get through uh, for a long, long time. A lot of clubs have been trying to replicate what Madrid has been doing, but they have failed miserably really miserably yeah so uh Del, i just wanted to just touch base with you all right but the first uh topic that we're going to talk about is uh the owners that you guys have and uh i know florentini uh florentino perez uh let's talk a little bit about him you know he's someone who's um i'll say not a um a kind owner i say uh, I'll, I'll give the name of ruthless you know he he wants to keep winning he he can't afford uh, the, the four-letter word L-O-S-E uh, in his dictionary. You know, it's nothing. It's all about winning for him. Del, talk us through. Now, what are your thoughts about your owner? I think I think he was president for two tenures. First was, I think, the early 2000s, if I'm not wrong. And I think that was the period when the Galacticos came. Uh, he had his policy, Zidane's and Pavons. He wanted to have a mix of world-class players and youth players but he never really found the balance and then he also looked into the commercial part of the club he really built them up he made them the richest club in the world at one point i believe still in the top two uh he, it's a very business oriented man so yeah. he wants to get things done his way you don't like it he doesn't give he doesn't give for them Mm-hmm. He just go about things his way. I mean, his first tenure, I would say, wasn't really a success for me. Yep. I think he had the idea, but was not. It didn't really come off because he made a few mistakes also. And then I think when after Caldron left and after he 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 quit, then Caldron took over for a period of time. I think that was the then Real Madrid slowly started to come back up. Mm-hmm. And then when he eventually came back, he came in a totally different mindset. He decided to give co- the coaches more time. He decided to trust the coaches more. He decided to invest more in the youth. He didn't just sign players for the sake of the name. Mm-hmm. He actually got them to look at the abilities. How, how are they going to benefit Real Madrid uh, football-wise and commercially as well. So I feel this is second tenure has been success he's really brought uh, real madrid back up to the peak of football and they were there for the last i think from 2006 to 2018 mm-hmm. that real madrid was fantastic so right. i think that that was the peak real madrid sweet i think that you, know, you you touch base with you know ramon caldron i think he is someone who actually enjoyed a, a great thing you know being a uh, madrid's president antonio i think you you will know all about uh our mr ramon caldron uh Tell us, you know, uh, the huge difference, you know, or the vast difference or the similarities between uh, Calderon and uh, Perez. You know, was they really highs and lows or, you know, or were they really similar to their, you know, uh, the philosophies and the way they brought Madrid up? Well, um, to be honest, I mean, the main difference in between Calderon and, and Florentino is that Calderon brought in some sort of like a professional structure for a club. Uh, historically, Real Madrid has been always been a very presidential club, meaning 
the president is the boss, is the one that makes all the decisions, operations-wise, football-wise. Calderon, uh, after uh, the first years of Florentino not being very successful, and don't forget the way uh, Florentino uh, struck at Real Madrid in in the in the early two thousand, which is by signing Luis, stealing Luis Figo from Barcelona, right? <laughs> that was the iconic. Play, I, I, yes, I mean that was so that was the that was a big shock. So of course, by doing that, he wins the elections, and I remember that he won the elections by the votes sent in the mail, right? So has been, I do remember that it was quite at the beginning, a little bit, uh, yeah, uh, peculiar the way that Florentino started at Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ramon Calderon, after he was not successful, then there were elections and Ramon Calderon brought in some sort of like a professional structure. And the reason why Calderon got the seed is because he defeated uh, Florentino uh, because he came along with Pedrak Mijatovic as a sports director mm -hmm. by then. And Pedrak Mijatovic had a solid history of, of Real Madrid. He's the goal scorer against Juventus in Champions League number seven in Amsterdam. So the story of Pedrak Mijatovic and Real Madrid has been always very, very, very close. However, of course, uh, this is football, and if you don't get trophies, especially at Real Madrid or the big clubs, uh, a change need to happen. And then, uh, yeah, you know, his background of Ramon Calderon has been always been, you know, like a good businessman. He used to be in the first board of directors of Florentino when Florentino in the two thousands yeah. um, came into the into the into the club as we as we spoke. But then, of course, some differences. He quit, and then he. He ran for president and he got uh, and he got the seat. Unfortunately, in two thousand and nine, uh, success was not there, and then there were elections. And I do believe that is when Florentino, since then, has been has been uh, at the at the presidency. However, going back to what I said at the beginning, this is a club that has been historically very, very, very presidential. You mentioned Joel, the business model that all the clubs have been trying to copycat, and I might ask you what is the business model of real madrid because nobody knows it and yeah. i just say is it's very presidential but if you ask me nowadays who may who is the sports director of real madrid florentino perez who is the president florentino yeah, perez. Perez. Who? so so it, as i say very presidential very presidential uh, uh, club and the formula for the past you know 13 years 13 for well i would say 13 years now it, it's been working why because maybe not in the amount of ligas that he has won yeah and they won of course this year but of course is it in the remarkable record of champions leagues that they've been able to to grab and of course i'm talk. we will talk i mean i'm sure we will talk about it but um uh, what is it? Uh, four Champions Leagues in the last five years, yeah. three, in a, three in a row. I can guarantee you guys that neither the three of us or anybody who might be listening or watching this podcast is going to leave again a team to leave. that wins three Champions League in a row. No. It's never going to happen. It, I believe it has happened once and it will never happen again. So. Yeah, we'll talk about the relationship of Real Madrid with the with the Champions League, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much you know, uh, yeah, some some ideas up here in the absolutely, in the man, Anthony, you were spot on with it. I don't think so. We are ever going to get uh, three in a row Champions League. Never. I don't think so it's going to be. But I think the, the the results happening. I think the reason why they are you not know, able to win Champions League under Champions League, La Liga after La Liga, is you no know, creating winning teams after winning teams. I think it's the transfer policy. That Madrid has been giving, you know, they'll talk us through. You no, know, uh, I'm always very curious to you know find out, you know, because I know Madrid has a very good academy, and I know uh, that they usually tap on the academy players as and when is needed. But lately, you know, I've seen they never really tapped on their academy players much, and you know, they actually have grabbed hold of their current crop of players, their core players, you know, such as Modric, Casemiro, Cruz, even Marcelo. You know, uh, they have just kept this core group for the past like what four or five years and yet they are still able to you know replicate 
you know, victories, you know, yeah, no, there was ups and downs, but still they were able to get into the Champions League final this season. Four years later, they are back at it again. Um, no, talk us through the the transfer policies. You no, know, are you are you okay with their transfer policies like this, or would you mean would you want it like moving forward? You no, know, let's tap on some academy players. Let's sign some young players. You know, what are your thoughts on this? I think right now he is moving towards uh, bringing youth in. He brought in, I think, Vinicius mm-hmm. three years ago. Brought in Rodrigo. Yeah. And then he's bringing some from the youth also. Like, I th- if I'm not wrong, I think Valverde also is from the youth team. Yeah, he's from the academy. Okay, yeah. And then you have that crop of Carvajal, Nacho, uh, Lucas. So all these are uh, Asensio. All these are coming up from the. These are the few players they chose from the youth team. To bring up but i think his transfer policy now is of course he's going to look to strengthen where of course we they cannot go on with cruz modric casimiro <laughs> forever i mean as good as they have been they will have to eventually replace them and i think they already have two in valverde and kamavinga oh, so yeah they just, yeah, they just need to find maybe someone to replace casimiro all right but yeah i think yeah, his, his transfer policy now <laughs> he is he is really He's really uh, transformed into looking at the better of the team, whereas last time he was looking at the commercial side, just superstars, yeah. mega right. Galacticos. Now he's actually looking to improve the team. And I don't know whether... I, and Rudiger also, I heard, I think Rudiger might be coming. Yeah, sign and stem. It's about to be mm-hmm. with yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and if you guys allow uh, allow me, I I think, to be honest, he's... I mean. To be where they are right now with this different policy in terms of of signing and releasing and and so on uh, and then of course uh, going on loan or, or providing loan mm. of, of some of these players to to other teams i think maybe it was necessary for him for for florentino to do those initials i don't know seven eight nine years of signing superstars with you you know and then combine them with the with the youth when when we speak in real at real madrid and this is pretty much you know knowledge across anybody who who knows a little bit about real madrid it's not just the players that end up playing at real madrid i can guarantee you that the school of football of real madrid is the largest uh, provider of talent um, in spain and i do believe that the formula that florentino has been using in the past is okay we'll sign this player or we will bring up this player from our youth academy if he can play in our first team great if not i am very sure someone else will be interested the first name that crossed my mind is Ahraf, the right back that i believe now is in yeah that i believe now is in psg if i'm not wrong after passing through italy i i I, I don't 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 get me 100 right on that but i think psg pay 35 million euros for this yeah yeah and i can guarantee you yeah i can guarantee you there are many many other 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 names and during the pandemic something that real madrid did very very well is of course hold hold the horses don't spend a lot of money sign the you know some of the players that you guys have mentioned and then those players that they were on loan if there was interest from the club that they were uh, that they were playing then of course okay you know offer them offer or, or make them make it an offer or maybe accept accept the offer and they've been able to cash in uh, a, a lot of money in in that sense uh, therefore uh, they are in a position to sign tomorrow uh, Kylian Mbappé and that's going to cost him a fortune but financially they are able to sign him and I've heard somewhere else that they were also I mean financially they could really face a couple of these two uh, two or three big signings so going back to to the beginning of the chat right this presidential way of running the club i'm the one who makes the decision i'm a good businessman i have a solid reputation uh you know for as much as my team you know brings in some some silverware i'm i'm happy to 
to to keep going. But you know, as I say, it's it's difficult to explain this this business model because nobody knows nobody, <laughs> nobody knows, knows a lot about it. <laughs> nobody knows. No, definitely, uh, man. But hey, you know, as long as Madrid keeps winning, and I know trophy halls keep <coughs> increasing, I'm pretty sure you know they will be increasing. Yes, Antonio, go ahead. No, no, I, I think Dal wanted to say something. I'm sorry, I think Antonio made a fantastic point also that uh, of him loaning out certain players, like he loaned out Ceballos, Odegaard. Yep. I think yeah, Akraf. Yes. Exactly. Thank you, Dal. You brought the names that I totally that I totally forgot. And and Odegaard is another is another is another good uh, good name. But I do remember uh, Carvajal spent a few years in Germany. Yes, uh, yeah, then he came. Say. Then then he <laughs> came back. Mm. Uh, so there has been a couple of cases where some of these players, you know, they they needed to do national service outside <laughs> outside. Uh, yeah outside outside madrid and then they came back as men and then they you know they can as grown up men and and they can you know they can deliver because as you might imagine is it's so so tough right to to find a spot and to and and to really hold your position in in one of these teams and we can talk about real madrid but this will apply to liverpool or man city whatever you know italy germany bayern de munich whatever is is so 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 difficult and you know but you know as soon as the team is is working and and winning um you know don't don't touch a, a single thing so it's it's just you know what what it works for real madrid right now is is this yeah man it's, it's just going to be a bit interesting i think one of the uh big i would say i won't say biggest flop or something but i think their strange uh signing and they let go of was uh ashraf hakimi Mm. I think that was something that was so mind-boggling for me because I knew that boy was going to be there. You know, he's going to replace Carvajal and he's going to let, just let loose. But and, uh, I think he went on to Inter Milan. He went on to Inter Milan. And then, I think he went to Inter, then PSG. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because the guy was, I think he also, did he? He came from, was it Dortmund? It doesn't matter anyway. Uh, yeah, Dortmund. Yeah, played for Dortmund also, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you thought like, oh, you know, this guy is, you know, Carvajal, see you later, you know, thanks for your services. <laughs> exactly. And at the end, you know, he's he's still there. They keep Nacho, which is an absolutely guy that, you know, belongs to the team, has been in the youth school of football for so long. He feels Real Madrid. He f breathes yeah. Real Madrid. He's quite of a flexible player, meaning mm -hmm. like he can play in, in, in a few in a few positions. And you know, uh, yeah, I'm just looking on the other side, Marcelo, who you know can play a few minutes here and there. But then they brought Mendy, who is also yeah, a good also signing. Good. You know, yeah. yeah. But then don't forget that not everything has been fantastic. And I can give you names like Gareth Vale. Yeah. Even even though he had a good year, I mean a few good years, but not has not been. The, the player that everybody expected and don't forget that this is the guy who earns 17 million euros per year net one seven think about that and he has played he has played 500 minutes this year and the other one which i would say has been very 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 unlucky is is eden hazard right oh, yeah S so you know not everything is working it's not a perfect machine however whatever formula nowadays is is working and at the end everything comes together if the manager is a good changing room manager and can you know control all these egos and all these <coughs> all these different uh, personalities anyway we can go uh, uh, on on and on on this but uh, yes just some thoughts there but th that's where we are leading up to, Antonio. You know, the flop signings, the great signings of Madrid. But before I even want to touch base on that, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a fun fact or, you know, just to crack your heads a little bit. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, Perez got the presidential last year, 2021. So, in four years, there's going to be a re-election. Uh, I'm going to give you some names and you guys are going to tell me if this is who you might want to see as the next Madrid president, especially you, Del. All right, uh, there have been there were some names, but these are the uh, four names that I can come up with that actually will go on in run for in the next four years. All right, first is actually going to be our Mr. Ramon Calderon. All right, next one is Rafael Nadal. Uh, he actually has mm. uh, you no know, spilled out some interest that he might want to be. Uh, next up is your former players. Then is uh, Emilio Butrugino. 
and also uh, Manuel Sanchez. So if given a choice, let's just say Dell, you are given the key to decide you know, uh, who is going to be the next Madrid president. Uh, out of the four, who would you pick though? Mm, I'll still go with Florentino Perez. You still go with Florentino Perez? Yeah, I'll still well, go with Florentino Perez because, mine, because of what he has done. Especially like Antonio said also just now during the pandemic, how he controlled the economic situation where mm -hmm. a lot of clubs suffered. He really He's been very it. smart. Yeah, he, they played in their training ground, the Alfredo Di Stefano Stadium, while they were building their Bernabeu. Still building. Yeah, right. So that's yeah. going to bring in, generate so much more income once it's fully operational. So, and he's also tightened the wages. He got them yeah. to take all the big players' pay cuts. And then, like, legends, like, if they didn't want to agree, like Sergio Ramos in case. Mm -hmm. I think he was offering a one-year contract, but Ramos, I think, wanted two. Yep. And he said, if you're not no. going to take that one year, bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, man. All right, Del, interesting, interesting choice to, you know, re-elect your current president. Antonio, how about you, sir? You have shared, uh, of course, in addition to Florentino, three very interesting names, three very realistic names. So well done on your research. <laughs> Thank uh, you. And the reason why, and the reason why I say this is because uh, one of the things that I personally do every day is I do listen to a couple of sports magazines that happen at night, and uh, everybody knows that Rafa Nadal is a is a solid Real Madrid player that yep. people, you know, would like him to see at least heavily <coughs> involved with the club. The other two names that you've mentioned, Emilio Butragueño, who is now the director of international, I think, relationships or some sort of like, you know, social yeah. institution. Uh, he could definitely, well, he has the, the capacity, the knowledge, the image and the personality. The other one that you mentioned is somebody who is very, very interested, has been in the background, Manolo Sanchez. And if you allow me to share a little bit more of history here, Please. Manolo Sanchez, together with Emilio Butragueño, Miguel Pardeza, Rafael Martin Vázquez and Michel, were the five players that in the 80s, early 90s, uh, made Real Madrid uh, win, if I'm not wrong, five ligas in a row. So it's a generation of players, like the same generation of players that Re uh, Barcelona had with Xavi, Puyol, Piqué, mm -hmm. Messi, yeah. Iniesta. Real Madrid had it 20, 25 years before. Uh, Manolo Sanchez is someone that is, uh, his father played for the club. He was also a, a center defender. Uh, he has really, really strong background. He has always sound as an alternative if one day Florentino Perez decides not to run for presidency, which I believe will be the only case that Florentino Perez won't be president, is if one year he says, OK, this is over for me and uh, I will, you know, share my credit or whatever that is. Uh, with whoever is going to replace me. I do have a feeling that we are not maybe very, very far from from that scenario of him saying, OK, I'm quitting from, from being president. However, he has, under my humble knowledge, two things pending. Number one is, of course, to present the amazing stadium that El Bernabeu will become next year. And second, I think his dream for the past at least five years has been to sign uh, Kylian Mbappé. And once he makes or, or fulfills those two dreams, a stadium, Kylian Mbappé, you know, it could be he's 70 plus now. He lost his wife a few yep. years ago. Uh, he he looks a little bit uh, tired. He has one of the best uh, businesses in in the world. He's in the yeah. construction uh, and infrastructure development. So he's of course a multimillionaire. He doesn't need the money. He's not doing this for the money at all. He's uh, yeah. super passionate about Real Madrid. But I do I do have a feeling that we are not very far from that uh, from that scenario of him saying, hey, you know what, I'm not gonna do it. 
could be Emilio Butragueño. Uh, Sanchez has also very good background behind. Uh, I don't think Rafa for sure is gonna yeah. uh, will 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 ever run. Rafa, whenever he retires, is gonna play golf and go fishing, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, man, I told you, you made some great points, but yeah, Dell, you know, I appreciate you saying that you want Perez back, but I think in four years' time, I I, I do believe, you know, honestly, I think Perez will be looking at you no know, to stop because we just saw, you know, one of the best uh, football agents and very notorious, you know, yes. Raiola, you know, he passed on. You know, I, I not being able to rest much, you know, so that you no know, the, the psychological, the mental effect really affects these guys a lot. So looking at these kind of scenarios, whereas maybe looking back and say, look, you no, know, I've got to take a chill pill, uh, you no, know, pass the baton on to someone, and uh, we are, we could yeah. be looking at you no know, Emilio or Sanchez to, to do the job. But amazing, whoever comes on, Madrid is still going to live on. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we're going to go touch base on your player signings. You know, I think Madrid, somewhere close to what Madrid has been doing, I think Liverpool is what has been doing recently under Heron Klopp of you know signing players under the radar and then creating and making them into stars. But I'm going to talk about your flop signings though, <laughs> because I think that is where the whole thing sparks a little bit. And I'm going to, I'm going to put my head on the chopping block. I'm going to seal the deal and say that I think I may be the most hated figure in Madrid if I'm going to say this. I'm going to start with the first player, which I always thought uh, he was the biggest flop uh, for you guys. And he's none other than my favorite player, Brazilian Kaka. Uh, I think he came in for about like what, 65 million euros, played four seasons and then went back to AC Milan. And uh, I think he wasn't the player where he came from Milan and... Uh, he wasn't the kind. He wasn't bringing the kind of the same energy, and you no, know, he couldn't really gather up much. I don't know. Maybe Madrid's nightlife was drowning him, or you no, know, uh, Madrid's number eight was just too much of a take uh, for him to uphold in games and stuff. Del, I know you're gonna. The way you look at me, it seems like uh, <laughs> you're gonna kill me anytime. <laughs> but uh, talk me through. I think uh, Kakao's. Uh, I think probably will be by top of the list. As for your biggest flop, though, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, go ahead, bro. I actually I kind of agree with you. I think AC Milan knew when they were selling Kaka that he was past his best already, he had a few injury issues, I think, and they knew that getting that much money for him and he's not going to be the same player was very good business. Like you're a Manchester United fan, I think you know what we did with Rafael Varane. I think it's the same. <laughs> yeah. <Tell me> about <laughs> yeah. They they knew something and then they sold the player off. So Kaka actually. Yeah, he didn't fulfill his potential. Then you got just a few names off the top of my head. Uh, Eden Hazard never fulfilled his potential. Very unlucky with injuries. Mm -hmm. I still think he's a fantastic player, given the chance. At one period, I think he had a very good combination with Karim Benzema. He was starting to yeah. pitch. And then pop, that PSG game, I think he got injured and everything went down here. Then a few very curious unlucky. ones. He's Jonathan been very Wood. unlucky with the injuries. Mm. Jonathan Woodgate. Oof. Came as a, I, 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 will, I will dub that as a straight look at Antonio straight up. He went. <laughs> uh, I think Del, you hit the nerve. I, I think Jonathan Woodgate is probably the most strangest signing. And I'm going to throw one more player into the mix Graveson. Hmm. I think Jonathan Woodgate and Graveson, two of the most strangest signing that I've, uh, I've ever seen. Uh, maybe why? Because I think during their club days in England, they were probably very stellar. They were really performing uh, good, but I think, if I'm not wrong, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Dale Lento. I think they, they, they signed Woodgate at the point of time because I think your defenders were injured. And then they needed someone to, you know, replace it, them and probably they got the best defender. At that point in time, yeah, Woodgate was playing yes, one of his yeah. best. In he his actually field. was very highly rated. And that's yeah. why they signed him. But he had a horrible time at Real Madrid. His debut, red card, own goal. <laughs> Never played for one year, got injured. <laughs> I got, I'll give you another weird I'll give you another weird signing. Julian Forbay from West Ham. Oof. I don't know what was that. Ooh, that, <laughs> I, don't, I think that I was don't, I don't, commercial signing. <laughs> I don't you see, as I told you at the beginning, guys, you know names that I absolutely uh don't uh, di didn't know they they exist. But the first three names you guys uh, mentioned, I would say maybe out of the Three of them, I think Kaka was the one that maybe had a little bit of, of you know, shine 
slightly, but uh, not much. The other two, I do believe Gravesen was also brought in in the winter transfer market. Yeah. Uh, you know, only once in a while, you know, all these, I call them, you know, you know, play players that they serve a little bit like a patch service, right? Because, you know, they are injuries or, or injuries and, and so on. And, and they, they are there to, to replace a uh, temporary only once in a while. Uh, the winter transfer market, you know, brings, you know, solid talent to stay, to stay in the club and, you know, to, to make a difference. The rest, pff, I remember, I mean, when I was like this, when, when Dal, you mentioned uh, Woodgate, because that was the name that I had in, in my, in my mind, I can't think of, of any other, well, I'm going to say one, even though he had a good, I think one or two years. Do you guys remember? Remember Robinho? Yeah. Oh my God, Robinho, that's classic. This, this, I mean, this guy, this guy was a star. Yeah. Was probably that was maybe that was maybe the, the overall mistake on on him. But uh, I think he had like one or, or two years uh, of, of good football. The rest he has disappeared, and I think nowadays he's having some issues with the uh, with the law. But anyway, uh, yeah, you guys share. Uh, good names of flaws but as i say right uh, nobody remembers them because what real madrid you know they've been winning and they've been winning don't forget eh? they've been winning the most prestigious tournament in the world which is the yes. uefa champions league if it if it was just one liga here one copa del rey there florentino would have more pressure on him but you know mm -hmm. as i say for champions league in the past five or six years this is something that you know will will kill any sort of negativity uh, around the club any signings that you know might not be successful because he's the one making the decision he's the one that's okay bring this guy or do not or no, or do not bring this guy, but he's so well respected, and I think majority of the of the yeah. fans and members of the club, they just you know they are just happy the way the way things are, the way things are going. Totally, yes. totally. I mean, I could. Yeah. No, sorry, sorry to interrupt. To give you oh, one, really? might be a unpopular choice, but I feel David Beckham also was a flop. Com Look, commercially, that, I was absolutely. I was. Ooh. I was thinking about it. Commercially, yes, he brought Real Madrid to a different level. His global brand, he made Real Madrid a much bigger club. But, but he, football, he, really? Footballing wise, I don't know. Wow. Because the, when he came in, he was on the right. And then Luis Figo was on the right. Yeah. So they had to make way for Figo. They made Figo change position and put Beckham on the right. And that's where everything that team structure, they didn't have a structure anymore. True. But the thing is, he was already coming into a very well established team. The likes of Ronaldo, uh, Brazilian Ronaldo, Zidane, Figo, uh, Ramos in defense, Casillas, and he just needed to come in and deliver his long balls and free kicks. Yeah, but I think in that moment, yeah, I think if you've got to say that expects, he wasn't really much of a bright high in terms of footballing expects, but commercial wise. Yeah, who, commercial wise, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. he brought us to a different yeah, level. But but that but Dal likes football and he's a purist in that sense so he, he's <laughs> able to put the the commercial side you know the commercial side of club so i i agree with you Dal, on 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 beckham and i'm sure that if we keep you know with with the list more more names is uh more names are gonna are gonna show yeah man i mean uh robino but in terms of robino wise i think footballing didn't really uh went well but if I could recall, you guys bought him for about 24 million, and then and then uh, City at the time was rich. They came in, and I think you guys, I think uh, they got him for double the amount of 40 ish kind of million. So I think Robino's sale was good, and then he went on to become a flop in City as well. So interesting, strange, and uh, you know, interesting bad signings that really went bad. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit of your underrated players that you guys actually signed. You know, there were a number of uh, players that uh actually you guys signed and you no know, had an immediate impact with the team and uh i'm gonna go with one of my all-time madrid favorite uh guti i think he has been 
I can't find any other underrated uh, player signings that Madrid have done other than him. Yeah, Guti. You guys have anyone? Let's start with you, Dale. Do you have any other underrated signings you feel that Madrid had uh, established? Mm, I think Casimiro. One is Casimiro. Oh, they brought him back. Yeah. I think they, they loaned him out and then they brought him back also. I think it really changed the dynamic of our midfield. Uh, underrated signings. Uh, well, Vinicius, definitely. Mm -hmm. At first, I thought, I I'm, I was afraid it's going to be something like the Robinho situation. Uh, you all brought up a good point. I was going that trajectory, but seems to have matured. Seems to be so... It's like almost world-class level now. In fact, I think he is world-class. It's a game-changer. Yep. Then, uh, it's a complete different player. It's a complete different player from from last year. And more probably the difference in between him and Robinho. And I agree with you, Dal, that he looked like Robinho at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> maybe the dif maybe the difference is 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 his environment and and the way the people that you know surround him and you know they've been able to ex you know tell him and convince him that you need to work hard and mm -hmm. or harder in this case because if you work harder. And take care of yourself. Uh, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, hard work always uh, pays back. Robinho had uh, such a bad popularity in Real Madrid because he was pretty much out every other night. And yes, and when and, and when you live in a big capital like like Madrid, you need it's to difficult. you need to you need a very good environment. Uh, if not, it's very very easy to get uh, to get distracted. I'm not sure if underrated or not. But I'm going to share a name with you guys uh, that I think I'm not the only one, at least in Spain, that thinks about what I will say, which is when Real Madrid signed this player, sure, there were some expectations, but I don't believe anybody thought that his overall performance for so, so, so long and for so many years was going to be the one that he's been able to to deliver and uh, i'm talking about luka modric Ooh, yeah. uh, totally. and as i say right i'm not sure if underrated or not but when i i do remember very very well that florentino perez went through a very very tough negotiation with the tottenham president uh, oh, that's tough yes and 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 when when he landed in in Madrid, I think majority of the people thought, oh, you know, good playmaker, number ten, great, good, you know, fantastic. We have whoever is in that position now, blah blah blah. But to be honest, the quality of football that this gentleman has been able to deliver, and always, always, always uh, being there and built such a solid midfield with the names that you share of of Cruz and uh, and Casimiro well to the point that uh, the midfield of Real Madrid nowadays is exactly the same midfield of UEFA Champions League number yeah. 11 and number 12 like five yeah. years ago five years ago correct yeah so uh, yeah again I'm not sure if underrated or not but I don't think everybody I don't think yeah anybody expected the quality of football for so long that Luka Modric has been able to deliver at Barcelona I had Real Madrid therefore he can do whatever he wants and I think he will keep signing one year after the other one until okay. the season <laughs> he will reach and say okay guys I'm done and then everybody will say thank you very much for your service I think you're spot on Anto a bit the reason is because one first and foremost Modric is from Tottenham Hotspur uh, and you know, not many players from Tottenham uh, actually went out uh, of a bigger club and then they succeeded. It's a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. I think after Modric, the only one was uh, Gareth Bale. You know, he came yeah. into the yeah, Galacticos right. and then he also made a name yeah. and then he's slowly sliding off uh, the whole uh, ladder and Modric is still there, you know. And he didn't just sustain, he propelled towards greatness, you know. I remember, you know, at the point of time, Croatia uh, wasn't really a, a powerhouse in, in international football. But the moment, you know, that they knew Modric, it's in the centre of the park, they know Croatia is some team that you're not going to mess around with. And, I think, and they really played really well. 
Uh, I think over. I think they went into one of the finals of uh, oh, yeah. the European yeah. Championships as well. So yeah, when, when look, yeah, when looking at, at these kind of players, I I always think about. I was watching some sort of some some interview with with Pep Guardiola re recently. And don't get me wrong, eh? I don't su I don't support. I'm from Barcelona, but I don't support FC Barcelona. <laughs> I, su I, I, I support the other team in, in the It's city, a disclaimer he has laid out. <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. Yeah, disclaimer. Uh, I do support Espanol, which is the other team in Barcelona, which, by the way, we are very close sentimentally and politically to, to Real Madrid. But anyway, uh, I was watching a, a recent interview with Pep Guardiola and and he, he referred to because they asked him, you know, how much Messi meant to you? And Pep Guardiola was saying everything. You know, he meant everything. But he knew that he was surrounded by outstanding players, the Chavis, the Iniesta, the Busquets, and so on. I want to use this to share that uh, the value of Modric at Real Madrid is not him playing excellent football. He makes all the players play and be way, and be way better. Benicio most probably is way better than last year because Modric is there. Uh, Casemiro has been able to deliver what he has delivered because Modric is there. Benzema has become he was a 8.5 player and now is a 12 out of 10 player. <laughs> this guy is unbelievable. They they brought any sort of a striker and he's still playing with every single coach or manager that Real Madrid has had. So I think players like Modric is not what they deliver, but also how they influence in in others. And of course, for a team like Real Madrid, this is is gold. You know, to have a guy like that is absolute gold. Yeah, gold Luka is one Madrid. word that we can never ever get out of our mouth with Luka Modric. But yes, underrated made a huge heap of success in Madrid. But Del and Ento your best ever signing that uh, i'm gonna lay this on the ground best ever signing that uh uh made to madrid and then he really went on to be the goal of football uh you guys have may may have someone else in your mind but i'm probably going with cristiano ronaldo himself i think he made uh i think he he, he requested first uh, I think a couple of years before he signed uh, to Fergie, uh, I know he wanted to go to Madrid because that was his dream. His all-time dream was to play for Real Madrid. And, you know, he was hoping that Madrid would come for him when he was 18 or 19, but Fergie came for him. So, I know, I think uh, play, after playing for about three years, uh, he requested to Fergie, uh, you know, can I sign for Madrid? And Fergie told him, you're not ready yet. You know, you're not ready and you know, uh, Madrid is going to be a little bit too difficult for you and you will be swallowed so he said okay boss i know i'll continue playing and six years later 2008 if i'm not wrong yeah 2008 uh madrid came for him and uh he went into the office and told gaffer you know i think this is the time and uh fergie also did not say anything he said i'll let you go uh it's going to be difficult but this is the start of your point of your career where you're going to go guns blazing and honest truth we saw the rise of Ronaldo uh, in many million ways possible to, to go by Dell. Is his will be is your best ever signing or do you have any other names in your mind? No doubt, Cristiano Ronaldo, hands down. Talk us through, man. Mm, I mean, Manchester United actually made him a world-class footballer. But when he actually went to Real Madrid, it's actually when he changed his game, more of a winger to a centre forward and that's when he really propelled himself to legendary status and I think also the first few years was hard wasn't really going his way because the team around him wasn't was still building they were still in the transition phase they signed I think that transfer window I think they signed Benzema, Kaka, Alonso a few players yeah. they signed also so they're still clicking at that point but when it clicked oh boy that and that rivalry with Messi in La Liga oh never gonna happen again <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. I mean, they pushed each other. Yeah. Like, oh, you're gonna score three. I'm gonna score three. You score four. I'm gonna score four. So I think mm. no doubt, Cristiano. I think they were match made in heaven. Yeah, yeah. a tip for tap in football. Yeah. Where I don't think so. It's ever gonna happen. But Antonio, you may have other uh, news in Spanish, whereby 
of another generational channel fighting up again. <laughs> Are we going to get that again, Anto? Uh, yes, of course. And I love that how you mentioned the the generation thing because uh, not that I do believe I'm the oldest in this conversation, but uh, uh, just to bring a little bit of history. And by the way, I want to say that uh, I don't think there is any doubt at Real Madrid or any solid Real Madrid fan that in modern era or the modern uh, or the modern times of Real Madrid, the best signing ever has been. And I do believe it will be uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. So uh, 100% agree with, with Dal and, and you, Joel. But as I say, bringing maybe or going back in history, uh, the guy that changed the history of Real Madrid and helped the club become the club that it is right now, and I'm talking about in the 90s, in the, in the 50s, yeah, when when the best president uh, before Florentino Perez was there, and I'm talking about uh, Santiago Bernabeu. Uh, in 1953, if I'm not mistaken, he made the decision to sign and bring in uh, Alfredo Di Stefano. And Alfredo Di Stefano, together with another set of amazing players, historically is the one that changes the history of Real Madrid. So, of course, uh, this is the guy that uh, Argentinian, Spanish uh, brought into Real Madrid. Real Madrid grabbed five consecutive, or well, I think five in a few years, I'm not sure if they were consecutive, uh, European Cup by then, no UEFA Champions League. Uh, and he's the one that that, that that changed the history and 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 he was the president of honor until i think he passed away uh, a few years ago and and is somebody who you know uh, real madrid pretty much uh, breathes a few names maybe a handful of names could be of course santiago bernabeu alfredo di stefano in the modern area i would say raul gonzalez florentino you have to put him there but sharing with the audience a little bit of history because most probably maybe majority don't know who is alfredo di stefano <laughs> i think they should they should they should google, google him uh, up. <laughs> and, yeah and find out that this guy is the guy that you know changed the history of the god of Real Madrid. <laughs> and, yeah and personally i'm very proud because he he also played for espanol he played for Spain mm -hmm. for spain national team and so on so yeah because as i say right I think in the modern era, there is no doubt the best signing ever has been, and it will be uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. He came, he came as a good player, and he left as an absolute uh, superstar, an absolute killer. Uh, so, yeah, certainly. I mean, he cemented the legacy of uh, Mr. Champions League in Champions League, and also, you know, cemented the legacy of Madrid. Uh, as uh, European royalties, it's going to go on for long. Uh, I think it's impossible to catch them in terms of trophy halls in the Champions League. They are European royalty for a reason, Del and Ento. No, we can't deny them <laughs> forever. Uh, in no, terms of, yep. The personality, if you allow me, I think it's also the personality of, of Cristiano Ronaldo of never give up, hard worker, be there early, live the last. You know, this mentality that Real Madrid above the style of football you know because real madrid historically have they haven't had a style of football like maybe yeah. barcelona was more on the possession side real madrid has been you know a little bit of an, an anarchic team in terms of football of, of a style of football yes but it has been very very successful and that style absolutely match the speed the strength the power of of cristiano and you know the numbers that he has I think he has pretty much every single record at Real Madrid. The guy is a is, is an is an animal. <laughs> indeed, indeed, animal guys. Uh, we're gonna wrap this uh, lovely Monday night podcast of uh, Real Madrid Galactico soon. I've got a couple of questions here in terms of uh, legacy. One for Dell, one for Ento, and uh, we'll wrap this up beautifully. And I'm gonna start with you, Dell. Dell, you know, uh, Madrid's legacy is something that goes really far very rich in success uh it's something that is going to go on for the next 
few decades, I'm pretty sure we'll be witnessing that. But my question to you in terms of uh, legacy is, uh, you know, Madrid has been consistent in winning trophies every year. All right, but with that said, the team that you have this year may not be the same next season. We talked about this off air uh, because most of uh, your players are you know, a little bit over age and you know, the pace may be dropped down and you know, all time for fitness and all this. So uh, do you think a rebuild will happen uh, with younger players and maybe new batch of Galacticos to be, uh, how to say, to be raised up or to be found? Mm, I think it's already happening. It's already in the works. They're already building a team to eventually replace this generational team. Mm-hmm. I think maybe you got one, two years more of Modric, Cruz, Casimiro. Yeah. It's what Modric is 36, I think. Cruz, 32. Casimiro, 30. So they, they do need to reinforce the midfield. So like I said, uh, off air, they already have Valverde, Kamavinga there. So I think maybe someone to replace Casimiro, maybe... They were looking at what Aurelian Chuameni, I think. That's how you pronounce his name. I'm not sure. The yeah. Monaco. <laughs> yeah, so looking at him. And then Kylian Mbappe, of course. Don't know. Don't, we don't know yet whether he's coming. Jeez, still playing Con. Yeah, he's still playing Con. We got the news <laughs> from Ento. <laughs> he is. <laughs> if, if he doesn't play for Real Madrid next year, Florentino Perez needs to leave. <laughs> so, yeah. So you already got that forward of Mbappe, Benzema, Vinicius. And then, if you revamp the bit, maybe right back, the one they really let go, Akraf, he would have replaced Kavahal perfectly. And then now they're getting Rudiger. And then they push maybe Alaba to the left. I've got so a I, feeling maybe it could be Sergio Santos, your academy player. I think he played for about 23 games in your under 20s, scored a couple of goals as well. Uh, I think he could be a, a good replacement for Kavahal. I think it's, this is difficult to get a, a right back. Oh, they maybe go to Norwich. Max Aarons, uh, he's waiting on the lines. <laughs> Maybe, but uh, usually I think like their policy, you'll loan out those academy players first, let them yeah. get some experience. But I don't think you'll throw them straight into the mm-hmm. fire. So I think for me, if I was Florentino Perez, I would definitely go and try to get Akraf there. I think that would be perfect on the right wing. And then you replace, I, I mean Modric, I feel he still has a couple of years left. Still His quality. Maybe Cruz not so much. I can see Cruz slowing down already. But then when you bring in Kamavinga and Valverde, I think they got a good balance there. I think it's already happening. They already set the, the, the path for them to build a very strong team, the foundation to build a very strong team. And I right. think they will eventually come back to the peak. Definitely. We'll definitely see the peak of that. I think the likes of Kamavinga, Valverde, I think there are a lot of uh, you know young uh Midfielders and you know, strikers that's in there. Uh, yeah, that, the one that I mentioned, Sergio Santos, you know, he could be one to also watch as a right back. Hopefully, he made it. But then, yeah, that's a great uh, way to say it, you know, Del. Uh, hopefully, the new batch of Galacticos will lift up to the name of uh, the past. Uh, Antonio, for you. Uh, previously, you know, when you hear Madrid, and now uh, we have been saying a lot about this, you know, kings of Europe is what we always, uh, you know, uh, associate Madrid with. Uh, but lately, uh, the Madrid hasn't been, has become a team of the past. You know, uh, not many uh, appearances in the uh, Champions League. Uh, the performance wasn't really up to standard. Uh, but you guys still managed to get to the finals this season. And uh, I think Don Carlos... Uh, contract is going to end in 2024 or maybe earlier and uh, that will be his last and he's going to retire from football uh who do you reckon that may come in as a manager <laughs> and is going to rebuild this young galacticos that dell has mentioned the likes of kamawinga velvetre sergio santos and, and a whole pool of uh, wonderful players who would you rather want or who do you think that's going to come in as uh, the next manager of uh, real madrid it's um it's a good question <clears throat> and the reason why i say this is because when everybody start feeling that sidan was gonna go there was a bit of a question mark or like oh you know who is gonna who will bring florentino perez uh, <clears throat> to to cover to cover for for Zidane. and nobody thought that uh, Ancelotti could come back, and nobody, of course, thought that Ancelotti was going to do such a 
such a great job. In terms of names that I recall have, uh, you know, they, they've been on, on the Spanish media. I think it's, it's not a surprise that I share with you that I believe is this. The name of Jurgen Klopp has been in the list for a while. Uh, I think Tuchel was also uh, in, in some sort of like a list, joking love and, and so on. However, my take on this is that if you look back in history, which type of managers have been successful at Real Madrid? And when I say successful, is either they won Champions League or La Liga. Copa del Rey, to be honest, is not relevant in Spain anymore. <laughs> <coughs> that kind of manager has been people that knows the club very well and that they have an outstanding relationship with Florentino Perez. Because as I say, Florentino Perez has a style of, of leadership that is very sometimes autocratic and very presidentialist in that sense. So you need to have someone in the changing room that is able to listen to Florentino Perez. If later on follow advice or not, is a different conversation. For me, names like Jurgen Klopp, Tuchel and so on, are more on the Mourinho side, okay? Which are managers with a bigger ego and that they really want to be the boss of the changing room and manage the players. And when you have so much talent and you have so much talent that has won so much in a changing room, it's absolutely almost impossible to, to, to to go there and be the elephant in the room and be a manager and and all oh, you guys now are gonna are gonna do what I'm gonna tell you. So to be honest, it could be one of these names, but of course we might need a little bit of like a revolution in the squad. I won't be surprised if maybe Fidan decides to come back in a couple. Uh, of course. Looking at history, there is one big solid name and he's doing very, very well in the inferior categories of Real Madrid, which is Raul Gonzalez. I think he's managing mm -hmm. now the Real Madrid B team and I think yeah. he's absolutely ready. A little bit of like the Guardiola version of, of Real Madrid. So, no, to give you a name is difficult. I just would like to, you know, I just share what I think is in the media. But overall, I think the most important thing is, is someone that is able to have a solid relationship with Florentino and at the same time being able to manage, I would say, you know, a, a, a complicated uh, and a changing room with people that, to be honest, they have won absolutely everything, right? All right almost, man. almost everything. Totally, I, don't know. Totally. I, I, I think. I think Klopp could be could do a good job. I would love to see him in Spanish football. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. You know? uh, yeah, yeah. I think I, I think yeah, I think it would be it would be it would be cool. I can't think of besides Raúl González, which of course I would also like to to see him managing Real Madrid because right? he used to play with some of them. So it's a little bit of like the Xavi nowadays in Barcelona, right? Yes, correct. That he has he has friends that you know he used to play. So I think that is very very tricky. I think these days that's what we're going for, you know, trying to get your former player to you know give him a chance to see if they're able to you know manage your club and bring back success yeah. or you know, just continue winning yeah. the success in it. Yeah. So it's been a beautiful Monday evening with you two fellas, you know, talking about the history of football, history of Real Madrid. Before we even wrap this up, I'm gonna put you two gentlemen in a spot because your beautiful club is gonna be playing in the next couple of weeks in the beautiful beautiful Champions League final in Paris. I'm going to go for the score prediction. <laughs> All you could do is tell me who's going to win and who's going to come home. All right. Who's going to, going to be the back home to Spain or is going to back home to England? So, Dale, I'm going to go with you. Uh, who do you think is going to win the Champions League finals? My head says Liverpool. My heart says Real Madrid. <laughs> But I'm definitely backing Madrid. I just feel it's destiny the way they came through the knockout rounds. So many, that Man City game especially, was lost. Even Guardiola took off his best players thinking it's done. Yeah. 
Bam, one goal. And then the belief, the self-belief. And when you got Karim Benzema on form, anything can happen. King Karim. Okay, Del Fates Madrid. Anto, in one word, who is going to win the Champions League finals? Real Madrid, don't lose finals. All right, man. And on that note, we're going to wrap this show up because Real Madrid, don't lose finals. With that said, thank you so much, Del and Antonio, in and all gracing us this back pass with Raz on a Monday evening. And once again, to all the followers out there, please subscribe to our Spotify Twitter, Facebook, Instagram pages, and we will be back once again. This is Joel signing off with the back party with Raz. Thank you, you two gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.